Um, so her project's entitled Abusing the Female Protagonist, Understanding Dirty War Distress Through Argentinian Theater. Hello, everybody. I'm very thankful that you all could be here today. And I'm very thankful for the sophomore essay experience as a whole. It's been a really wonderful, wonderful time, and I'm sure all of my classmates would agree with me. Um, so how I came up with this topic. When I came to school in the fall, I knew absolutely nothing about Argentina, besides maybe like musical Amida. Um, and I ended up taking in the fall both a Latin American history course and a Latin American theater course. And being a Spanish theater double major, that Latin American theater course really was something that I found myself being very passionate about. It was sort of like the perfect interdisciplinary study for me. And I decided that I wanted to further investigate that in my sophomore essay. Furthermore, I'm going to Argentina in the fall, so I knew I wanted to focus even more specifically on Argentinian theater. And I knew that Argentinian theater as a whole is still too broad a subject, so I decided to focus that even further on Argentinian theater during, after, or about the Dirty War. Um, so, the Dirty War. This was a time, um, it officially started in 17, uh, 1976 and lasted until 1984. And during this time, the military junta, which was a, a military dictatorship, came and basically took over the country. And the time period is noted for disappearances, uh, los desaparecidos, which are people that basically nobody knows what happens to. And a lot, of, a lot of things came out of this, especially theater. So I read a bunch of plays, and three of them I decided to focus my paper on. The first being Stripped by Griselda Lombardo, written in 1974, so two years before the Dirty War officially started. Uh, Paso de Dos, written by Eduardo Pavlovsky, written in 1989, which is after, uh, or which is rather kind of like right towards the end of the Dirty War, and From the Waist Down were in 1999 by Diana Rosnovich, which is several years after the Dirty War. And it was interesting, even though these three pieces all were from different time periods, they all focused on the same subject matter, and they all kind of had the same theme and had that thematic implication expressed in the same way. Uh, so to start with Strip, which is Griselda Gambados. Now this play, it's a one-act play, and there's only one character who talks who's a woman. She comes in, she's trying to get a job as either a model or an actress. It's, it's ambiguous to what exactly she's doing. So it can be inferred that she's actually trying to get a job as a sex worker or something more taboo like that. Um, she enters the stage and there's a young man there who points to various articles of her clothing and she just surrenders them. And by the end of the show, she is just almost naked and giving up all of her clothing. Now the title strip, it's kind of, assumed from the beginning that something along those lines is going to happen. Um, but what really makes this interesting is the way in which it happens. And I talk about this being an example of psychological abuse because she's assuming her subordination. He's pointing out, yes, you're subordinate, give me your clothing, and she's giving it up willingly. So it's really unsettling to see a woman, a woman you know, accept that by herself. Um, the Spanish title, Despojamiento, uh, or rather the verb despojar means to strip the hide from an animal. And when you think about it in that context, it really makes it a lot stronger because stripping the hide from an animal is, is much more severe than taking off clothes. It's, it's surrendering one's mortality. Um, also, by having it something related to animals, it ties in the idea of dishumanization. Um, so I thought that that was really interesting and really unsettling. And that was definitely the goal of it, to make the audience really unsettled. Um, and a similar tactic was used in Eduardo Pavlovsky's Paso de Dos, which is the piece that I really fell in love with out of these three. Um, Paso de Dos was especially interesting because I read about it in a book by Diana Taylor, who's one of the leading scholars in the field at the time. And um, I read the text after reading her interpretation of it and was like, well, this has absolutely nothing to do with what I read. Because the reason why Paso de Dos is so important is the way it's performed in production. And I was lucky enough to find a really detailed article describing a production of it uh, directed by Laura Yusem, where Eduardo Pavlovsky actually played the part of the main male there. 
And in this production, it starts off with him in a military uniform, and he's raping the female protagonist on stage. And eventually, he beats and murders her on stage. Uh, not actually murder the actress, <laughs> but murders the character. Um, and again, the same idea of something being really unsettling. And I saw this reoccurrence in, in Strip, and in Paso de Dos, and in From the Waist Down, which is the next one I'll talk about, and I just wondered, why? What, what does this do to an audience? Why would an author want to do this? In Paso de Dos, it's really clear that there's this idea of dominant and subservient. The male being the dominant, the woman being the subservient. He feeds on the gender roles that exist in society and that were existent during the Dirty War. And one thing that I thought was especially interesting about this production is that the audience was surrounded by a pool of mud and usually fluids or waters are symbols of femininity uh, because of the menstrual cycle or breast milk. Um, and I thought that it was interesting that the audience was surrounded by this metaphorical uh, metaphorical pool of vulnerability. So they come into there and it's understood, okay, you're a vulnerable body and now you have to watch this. Another really interesting about that production is that they had two actresses playing the female protagonist. One was just her body, the other was her voice who sat in the audience. So in that sense, the audience becomes one with that protagonist and it makes it a really good way for them to empathize with her. Um, again, very unsettling. And that brings me to the next one, From the Waist Down, which is also unsettling. That seems to be the reoccurring word in this presentation. In From the Waist Down, there's a married couple, Eleonora and Antonio, who are having difficulties with their marriage. And in order to try to make up all these problems, they hire a sexologist, uh, who actually is an ex-torturer. And the sexologist slash ex-torturer comes in and gives the male character this like, master uniform and the female character a slave outfit. That's how they describe it, at least. And then they start beating each other, and again, the theme of abuse. And in the last scene of the play, the two of them are pretty battered, which I think is interesting that both the male and female is battered in this case. And basically, they're using their abuse to get attention pub uh, with publicity. So they're being exploited in that sense. And What's interesting about this is that it, again, has that theme of female being subservient, male being dominant. And I even start off my paper with the quote, um, put on these chains and stop moving like a liberal woman. We can't stand independent woman, which is from, from the waist down. And again, that idea that the male is dominant and the female is not. And one thing that makes this work interesting is that the male character when he's beaten up, it's because he's emasculated. It's not because it's not because he's not, or rather, it's because he is given feminine characteristics, which makes it possible for him to be abused. And to tie all of this back together, the Dirty War, the military junta acted as that dominant party. The Argentine people, the, the people that were disappeared or tortured, they acted as that subservient body. So here you have this power structure I use the word patriarchy a lot in this paper because that's essentially what this power structure is, male dominant, female subservient, and the dirty war mirrors that. And <coughs> this structure, this patriarchal structure, it existed before the dirty war. Griselda Gambato noted it. She said, hey look, this is patriarchy, and even though the dirty war hadn't happened yet, her piece is fairly prophetic in the sense that it says this is what could happen. And then you have Eduardo Pavlovsky, who, in the heat of the Dirty War, says, all right, yes, I'm, I'm very much influenced by this idea of patriarchy, and he writes this play where he expresses all this. And then you have Diana Rosnovich, several years later, and only about 20 years ago, where it's this idea that, not 20 years ago, 10 years ago, that it's this idea that patriarchy still exists, so what are we, what are we putting ourselves out for? Can something like the Dirty War happen again in our future? It's, it's a very disturbing thought, but I think that these authors definitely have a very effective way of making this message clear. If somebody watches abuse on stage, they're going to be startled and they're going to think about this. And in that sense, they've all succeeded as playwrights and it's, it's really an interesting topic to, to go through for that reason. Um, does anybody have any questions?
questions. I want to clap. <laughs> You said kind of the reoccurring word of your presentation was unsettling. I wonder if you looked at all into kind of the tenets of theater of cruelty, whose yes. kind of uh, whole idea is that yes. uh, ridiculous unsettling of the audience. I'm actually uh, glad that you asked that. But the beginnings of this research project, I was looking at Brecht and I was looking at Artaud and I was just looking at these different theater styles. Artaud is known for theater of cruelty, which is basically a theater form where you put your audience there and really disturbing things happen and they are forced to it. I think the perfect example of theater of cruelty would be a show where there's mice all on the stage and the actors just stomp the mice to death and the audience has to watch that. Uh, and you may ask why, but that's exactly what Artaud wanted you to ask. He wanted you to see that and be like, oh my goodness, there's blood everywhere, this is terrible. Um, and Brecht is known for his kind of like abstract meanings and uh, the fact that all his works are didactic, that you learn something and that there's always this greater message and if you don't get the message then you're just not getting Brecht. And what a lot of scholars call this type of drama is theater of crisis, which is, I like to describe as like a morph between the two of those. It's Artaud and Brecht and, and all these sort of things pulling from history too which, like I mentioned before, Diana Taylor, the leading scholar in the field at the time, um, she talks about this idea, this theater of crisis, where it's, it's very postmodern. You're taking all the, all the evils going on in society and you're producing theater based on that. More questions? Yes. Yeah, um, a couple of questions. So they were basically all one act plays? Yes, except for the last one, which was a five act play, but it was very short. The scenes were no longer than like three pages each, so. Okay, and the other one was um, the uh, female characters were played by females, correct? Yes, all, okay. all, no gender bending whatsoever. Okay. Yes, Just yes. a quick question. Uh, you translated uh, two out of three, but how exactly, uh, possibly does, what exactly is this? I think it's to be on the title. Um, like a walk of the two, like. Right? Is that, is that? It's also a dance, possibly yeah. a dance. <laughs> um, yeah. I hadn't thought too much about the title and possibly those, yeah. to be honest. But, but this, this dance, probably, if you looked into it, I don't know very much about the possibly those. It's a very male dominated dance, would be my yeah. guess. But I'd have to look into it. That's a good question. Well, I imagine that also with that staging of that like really abusive scene with the beating, I assume that that could be compared to a dance, too. So, so the one with the, the dance in the title, that was the one with um, the rape? That was the one with the rape in the pool of mud and the two actresses, yes. It also might be interesting that you have an oral component that doesn't match the physical component. Yes. So you've in fact got two things tangoing with each yeah. other during this play. And again, that was all created by that director. It was This was the first production, and I, as I mentioned that Pavlovsky played the leading male in it, so I, I imagine them all being like, okay, what can we do with this work? Because like I also mentioned before, the text is nothing like the production. Or at least there's so much more in the production that you wouldn't have in just the text alone. Anything else? So, yeah, can you talk more about kind of the process that you underwent in terms of selecting these three plays? I, I know yeah. it sounds like early yeah. on you had so many different oh, choices yeah. even right within the, yeah. this particular context. So I definitely knew that I wanted to do something with gender because I also took a women's studies class and I have written many papers about gender-based things. And these were the ones where it was really like, glaringly there. There was another one that I read that I really had a lot of trouble not doing, uh, El Campo, which is another Griselda Gambado piece. Uh, it was also longer, and there was a lot more in there, so it was it was really hard for me to be like, okay, here's this piece, but I'm only going to talk about like one sixteenth of the things I could talk about in it. And her other piece strip was pretty short and pretty really focused on what I wanted to talk about. There is undeniably gender there. I'm wondering the extent to which an allegorical reading might actually work in tension with a feminist reading. That is to say that to the extent that it is political, it almost essentializes women 
and suggest that they are really a stand-in for something yeah. else, the nation, well, or something like that. Interestingly so, enough, in two out of these three works, the characters aren't given names. Their names like woman or she. Right. Uh, and I think like in that sense, it really touches on that idea of allegory because it's like these people are representing humankind, and not even just humankind. They're a specific gender of humankind. Also, very Brechtian kind of name yeah. the characters. Yeah. As he or she. It paints a very brutal period of, you know, during that dirty, the dirty war period. Yes. Have you looked into it? Have things? Have this helped change things? You know, oh, I mean, better there. Uh, yes, I, I would. I would compare. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't worry. I'm not going to get. Uh, hopefully, I'll get beaten up when I go to Argentina. <laughs> um, society functions the same way that we do now there, um, but it is still lasting because this ended in 1984. So. It's very likely that a lot of people out there are, you know, ex ex uh, victims. Or, more interestingly enough, there are people in there due to like uh, la ley de oh, some law that pardoned a lot of people who were responsible for dirty war crimes, saying that they were, you know, under working under orders of other people. So these people that may have actually been torturers may be walking around in the streets and may be, you know, on, waiting for a bus with their victim standing right next to them. So in that sense, it's still very real in the sense that people are still alive who have experienced that, including the people who have inflicted some of this pain. Um, but it's not like the military is going around killing people on a daily basis in Argentina right now. <laughs> or ever. Right now. <laughs> very palpable as an Argentine neurosis. Argentines are very into theory and very into psychology, oh, yeah. and this is very present in their art and in their yeah. theater. And so. Um, in that sense, you'll encounter it probably more than theater, probably very leftist. Theater days. is blooming in Argentina. It's really hot right now there, especially in Buenos Aires. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, uh, with your background being able to read, speak, and understand Spanish, how central did you find that knowledge, and what kind of uh, gaps in translations did you notice that may have been kind of affecting or important? Uh, well, I was able to find translations for two out of the three works, Paso de Dos, I read in Spanish, um, which like I had mentioned before, this text isn't really that applicable to how it's actually performed. So I was reading this and being like, I'm either terrible at Spanish or <laughs> there's something in here that I'm missing. And after reading that, I understood that it was all this very abstract interpretation of it. But again, um, without the ability to speak Spanish, I wouldn't have been able to use that text at all. A lot of, a lot of Spanish works in general have not been translated. Uh, which makes it difficult for us to study these things in the United States. We're at a lack of translators right now. Would you say that kind of accounts for just the overall lack of Knowledge. academia compared to French or Italian? I would, I would totally words? agree. Um, I know right now in my Western theater history class, we're talking, we talked about the Spanish Golden Age, and very few works from the Spanish Golden Age are translated into English, and for that reason, very few people study it. I would say that it's very similar to Latin American theater, in fact, more so, because this is a really contemporary art as opposed to the Spanish Golden Age, which is, you know, 1500s, 1600s. Future career, translating all these plays. Hey, if I can my Spanish skills. <laughs> Any other questions? Very good.